April Fools, this is not going to have a lot of math in it. There's probably not even a single equation in this talk because it's most about a review that I did of other literature, of other people's studies, looking at how to balance um, river design by placing hydropower dams um, within a river basin. So let's see, how do I advance this? I'll start out with a joke. So Einstein, Blair Pascal, and Sir Isaac Newton were, um, were playing hide-and-go-seek. And Einstein counted, he said, one, two, three, and he turned around and he said, and turned around and right there was standing Sir Isaac Newton. He said, aha, I see you, you're it. And Sir Isaac Newton said, no, I'm not. I, he had drawn a one meter square and he looked down and he said, I'm, um, a square meter over a Newton, or I mean over a Pascal, so I'm, wait, I'm a Newton over a square meter. I knew I was going to screw it up. So I am, a, I am Pascal, and that's who you've caught. I'm terrible at jokes. So um, in river portfolio development, and we like to think of river basins as portfolios, um, there's a shift in ecosystem services as you develop rivers and as you develop other natural systems. And we've had a lot of great talks at the Baker Center about this. And one of the interesting um, insights that we heard when Elena Bennett was here was her observation that you tend to have an increase in the provisioning surfaces as you develop river or as you develop ecosystems and a decrease in other kinds of ecosystem services. And I think that's also true in rivers when you add dams. And um, you can quantify that, and there have been some attempts to do that. In this study, which was by um, Sanders et al. in 1990, they asked people for their willingness to pay to protect certain dis uh, lengths of river or numbers of rivers. And you can see that there was kind of a, a saturation curve to that, where they were willing to protect up to a certain number of rivers, but they didn't really want to pay to protect all the rivers. And you could also look at the energy side of that and look at how much energy cost you're, you're giving up when you, when you don't develop rivers and then look at your return on investment. And there are two approaches to looking at this question. One is which river segments should we protect and the other is where should we put dams. So those are two different ways to look at it and they use different approaches and different tools. The reserve design uh, paradigm I'm sure you're all familiar with from ecology is very popular especially in Australia and it's been used mainly or come from um, terrestrial systems mainly and it has kind of a terrestrial bias I would say and that that's where the, the tools came from and it, I don't think it's terribly well designed for aquatic systems yet but I think it potentially could be and then the other angle of it is where do you put dams if you just turn around the question and think about it that way so there are kind of two different paradigms or kinds of studies and people coming from different approaches and how they solve the same problem. So the methods that are used for these in reserve design they have different um, different advantages and disadvantages. There are existing tools like Marksan I'm sure how many of you have heard of Marksan? So a few of you have at least and then there's a, a tool called Zonation that is designed to be for river systems, but it, it doesn't have quite all of the optimization advantages that Mark Sand does. Um, they're well suited for a static landscape where you have diversity and you want to try to tailor your reserve toward where the diversity is or you have, and you can also put in like flexible user de defined penalties. But what I don't like about it is um, A, the objectives are static, right? So you've just got a landscape of diversity and that's what you've got to work with and so it's kind of a non-no-brainer to do it even without Mark Sand. Um, and the other thing is that the penalties are fairly um, arbitrary so you just make them up to get the result that you want. And the kinds of penalties that you can use are things to try to keep this, the areas that are included in a solution spread out, things to try to ensure that downstream or upstream areas are included whenever downstream areas are included. So those are the kinds of things that you can um, use as constraints. And the other thing is there, the costs on the cost side of things, and that's, this is really the biggest problem I think from the perspective of people interested in hydropower. The costs are really land-based, like they're land purchase oriented, 
and they're not really designed to look at uh, what is the foregone energy that we're going to be um, losing in the future, what are the capital costs at this point location in the dam rather than an aerial amount of land that you need to purchase. It might be useful in sort of an off-site mitigation setting, and that's something we're also working on. Um, but it's not really very well tailored or designed for a hydropower question. The other thing I don't like is it uses some of the, not everything, but um, like zonation, for example, uses prioritization, which does not give you globally optimal solutions. So that's a concern. So the other side of things is trying to decide, using optimization, where to place dams. And people are using network tools to do that and also other tools. Um, in many cases, network tools are used just to do kind of a sensitivity analysis to see which dams have the most effect on opening up air habitat upstream, which is a fairly simplistic way to look at things, but it could be improved on in future. And the network tools, I, I don't see them as kind of a whole area or, or tool set by themselves, but they give you kind of a, a framework of, or a system of tools that you can use in, in doing your work, and I've been using them. Um, Mike Kelly helped me with implementing some Network X libraries in Python, and I've also, the, the model that I'll show you at the end was developed in R using iGraph. Um, there are actually two ways to use a network approach, and the classic way that networks are representations are used in graph theory for ecology has been, in metapopulation theory at least, has been to define habitat patches and then, you know, have the edges link those patches and treat the patches as nodes. But in river systems, it's kind of confusing because your natural tendency is to want to treat the nodes as the confluences of rivers or the dams and have the edges be the actual rivers. So it's kind of a physical network rather than a, a, an ecological network. And in the way I'm using it, it's just kind of a tool for describing the physical habitat. And a drawback is that um, it's one-dimensional, right? So you have to use weights or something in order to, to get some assessment of habitat. And a, a fairly simplistic analysis you can do is to identify a, a maximally connected subnetwork of nodes, or, or edges, rather. Um, and, and that tells you, okay, within this sub maximally connected network of habitat, we're not going to have any dams to um, create barriers. So we did a survey of, and when I say we, this is coming from a review that was done by Rebecca Ephraimson and Jeff Opperman and myself and Mike Kelly. Um, and these are kind of the different things that we tried to understand from the studies that we looked at. Decisions about dam removal, decisions about where to site dams, decisions about where to provide upstream passage for fishes. Uh, what methodology was used, reserve design, network modeling, spatial optimization, prioritization, like a rank and score system. Um, and then in terms of how the problem was formulated, did they consider an energy objective? Did they consider economics? And was connectivity considered? And you know, then what was the kind of ecological objective? And that varies quite a bit. There are some where it's habitat and simply looking at the maximally connected subnetwork size. Uh, many of them focus on migratory spe fish species, diadromous species particularly. So those are the ones that need connection to the ocean, like salmon and eels and st some sturgeons. Um, what, was there actually dynamics in the model? Do they look at population or metapopulation dynamics? And that's very rare. I, I think there's only, well, actually it doesn't look that bad, but. Um, there's a study by Ziv et al. in the Mekong, and Zhang et al. did a lot of work in the Airy, um, in Lake Erie and its tributaries. I'm trying to see who else. There's a very old study by Paulson and Wordston in the Columbia River, and um, a more recent study on the East Coast that, uh, that used population dynamics or population modeling. And then there are a lot of studies that, used, that looked at multiple species and biodiversity, and those are the ones that tended to use Mark San or zonation. 
Some of them, or only one of them actually, that was the Zeng study, looked at invasive species. So there's a trade-off between opening up habitat for invasive species and allowing um, native species to go upstream. And um, the bottom, whether or not they had dynamic objectives. So these are the spatial decisions that we're focused on. At what spatial scale should we pose these questions? Should we have fewer main stem dams at, or more tributary dams? So you tend to get more energy at the main stem dams, right? Because there's a lot more water. Um, so you might not need as many of them to produce the same amount of electricity as you might if you put all of those dams up in the, in the tributaries. So that's this question. The second is, if regardless of what you decide on that first question, do you want to distribute or cluster your dams among tributaries? Is it better if they're all kind of clustered into one branch, or do you want them to be spread out? And then, you know, within a, within a sub-basin, where should we put the dams along individual rivers? Should they be closer together, farther apart? What do you think? And finally, where should we provide passage? So just talking about the scale question first, let me just put these all up here. There's an example of the Penobscot River where they did not use formal optimization methods, but they, had a, they actually had a stakeholder um, organization that was in the context of relicensing their dams in Maine, and they actually got together and they came up with a win-win solution. And I don't know if it's the optimal solution if we would go in and model it, but they did come up with a solution where they decommissioned and removed the dams with the greatest impact on shad and other anadromous fish migrations. And they provided fish passage improvements at some of the remaining dams in the yellow there. And that's a little fool, because I got fools on a lot of these. Um, and they made capacity and efficiency upgrades at the remaining dams. And in the end, they ended up with the same amount of energy being produced and much more of the basin being accessible to migratory fishes with an annual shed run that's projected to be two million fish. So it's time for a joke. Let's see if I can do better with this one. A biologist, a physicist, and a mathematician were sitting in a cafe, sidewalk cafe, and they looked across the street, and there were a man and a woman that walked into the building. And a little bit later, five minutes later, a man and a woman and a third person came out. And the biologist said, they have multiplied. The physicist said, oh no, measurement error. And the mathematician said, if exactly one person enters the building, it will be empty. Does anybody get it? <laughs> Explain it. <laughs> oh, OK. I thought it was like one times zero, so I, that's why I had to come here to get somebody to tell me what. <laughs> okay, so the first question, more tributaries versus fewer main stem dams. Um, just to give you the hydropower perspective, energy is generally a product of flow and the head, so the, the uh, difference between it, that can be estimated by the local slope, right? So here's the slope is orange, and it tends to be higher in the um, upper areas. But usually the effect of flow is much more important, and so you tend to have more dams on main stems. Um, biota, what, what do you think would be more important, protecting the tributaries or protecting the main stems? Well, I think it kind of depends on whether you've got migratory species or not that need to have access to the ocean. We know that biodiversity of fishes tends to increase downstream, and it's kind of a longitudinal gradient where it's nested, and you increase the number of uh, species that you pick up as you go downstream. But then there's this question of risk, right? Because some people, like Robin White Wables, maintain that you have more risk if you put all of your species or your... your um, if you have your reserves down in main stems, because they're all exposed to the same disturbances, right? So here's a hypothetical trade-off curve between energy production and ecological portfolio value on the question of more tributary versus fewer main stem. And here you have dams all over the place. Here you have no 
dams with a high ecological portfolio. And kind of the question is, what's that going to look like? And this is all hypothetical, so I don't really know. But um, So the question of correlation has come out in the, with regard to whether you should cluster dams or not. And um, correlation in terms of exposure to risk is a con consideration because of metapopulation dynamics. And there are two examples of where you might have um, mixed salmon. This is, I think this is, um, this is more of a, a temporal example where you have um, different salmon stocks that are fluctuating over time. And this is kind of a classic example where they're out of phase. And so the resource is available all the time because they're not um, fluctuating together. Well, you can have the same kind of thing spatially, but we really don't understand the spatial structure of disturbances in streams very well. We don't know whether it follows networks. Is it going to be like spills, like at the TVA at fly ash? Is it going to be, you know, people usually think of things like volcanoes, but, you know, I don't know. Is that really the kind of disturbance? Are the disturbances going to be Euclidean, or are they going to be following the network? Or are they going to be coming up the network? like invasive species. So that's a big unknown. So here are some alternative configurations. I sort of went through an exercise when putting together a graph for a paper of trying to see if I could take the same number or, or dam summing to the same number of energy units and then um, just put them, it was actually really hard, and then put them in this like fox head looking thing in a way that you had the same amount of energy but you were il illustrating different principles. So for A, we have small dams that are distributed among the tributaries, but we still have a core area. I guess you can't really see the, the um, reserves very well, but you have this like core area that's all reserved, so they have good access to the, to the ocean, presuming that that goes out to the ocean. And then the second one, you have large dams that are concentrating in the main stem, and they're blocking the ba basin outlet. So you wouldn't think, except for resident fishes, that that would be very good. And the, that also, um, one good thing about that, though, is that you have all these tributary reserves, so they would, have, they would be protected from, from spatially correlated disturbances. And then C, we've got small dams clustered within a few um, tributaries, and then you've got a large connected core reserve. And then finally, we've got a combination of large and small dams. And these are spaced far apart so that you have tributaries coming in. And um, you don't have as much area of individual reserves, but you do have each segment having quite a lot of tributary habitat. So that leads us to the second question of how to space um, between dams. And um, in this study that I did with White Sturgeon, and it was a, a modeling study. Um, I looked at the spacing of dams and, and used a PVA model to look at the future persistence of white sturgeon. And I found that if you, if you decrease the spacing, you ended up with just reservoirs, a series of linked reservoirs. And that, there are, that's what happens in a lot of places, like in the Columbia River. Um, and there was no freshwater habitat or free-flowing freshwater habitat. So there was less um, diversity of habitat. And also you had the production of larvae that would just get swept out of, the, out of the reservoirs and wouldn't stay upstream, so you couldn't maintain upstream populations. So you ended up sort of depleting the upstream populations. So that leads you to understand that if there is a need to have at least some length between dams or tributaries so that you can have production without getting it all you know, lost downstream. And um, I have a new colleague, Brenda Prashil, who has published on the importance of tributaries. And another aspect of that is that um, confluences turn out to be fairly important sites. They tend to be used for spawning. They have unusual deposition properties. They have thermal, uh, they provide thermal refuge in some cases. So that's another reason to have tributaries between dams. Another question is where to provide passage, upstream passage. And in the, using that same model, I looked at different combinations of whether to decrease the spacing between trash bars that keep sturgeons from going into the 
getting entrained into projects and getting chopped up by turbines, or whether to um, provide downstream passage alone with, or to provide upstream and downstream passage or to provide upstream passage alone. And it turned out that it depended on the situation. If you had two juxtaposed long segments, um, either providing 50% spacing and having sort of this supported upstream segment that where it's a, the d adults could not get entrained and they were just breeding up there and then having their offspring go downstream, that worked pretty well. And so did having upstream and downstream passage, which is basically like having no dam. But if you were in a situation where you had a long segment above a short segment, then it was better to keep the adults upstream, definitely. And providing passage was not beneficial. And you can see that, you know, depending on what the juxtaposition of the, the different habitats were, there were different solutions that were beneficial. And here's an example of a study in the, I think it's the Willamette Basin by Kubi et al. And this is a solution where they gave equal weight to hydropower and storage. And they found a solution where um, they provided fish passage at 21 dams, removed 44, and left 85. And supposedly they were able to allow salmon to, remove, to move around freely within 74% of the drainage. And they kept most of the hydropower. So there can be some benefits to using these kinds of theoretical models. And, and you know, we don't have a lot of opportunities to actually remove dams here in the United States or to add new ones. But they're, they're, you can learn a lot about how you can modify their operations. And, and you have to take the realistic considerations into account. Like you know, if you move fish upstream, what are they going to be going into when they go up there? Is it going to be this death trap reservoir? You know, so that you're basically just creating an ecological trap, or are you actually doing some, some good for the species? So these are the propositions that we, we came up with out of this review. First, to formulate spatial decisions at the scale of larger river basins, because just from an optimization perspective, the bigger you can make the problem, the more op opportunities for good solutions you can find, and the better the solutions are. Would you all agree with that? Or? Anybody argue with that? No. OK. That you should concentrate dams within tributary subbasins to maximize fish habitat. And so that's kind of, um, there's a trade-off there between the spatial risk distribution and um, wanting to keep dams together. And I think there's also an advantage to doing that from an energy perspective that you should disperse the freshwater reserves among the remaining tributary subbasins, and finally ensure that the habitat between dams will support and retain production. And then when you get into realistic situations, you need to be careful not to create ecological traps by using theoretical models that don't have any of the realism that is needed to simulate those traps. So I'm going to give two case studies if I have time. We have time, plenty of time. OK, so right now I'm working on eels. And you can see that they're a, they're a, um, a species that are at great risk from hydropower. These, this is a trash rack. I've been talking about trash racks, and you have no idea what I'm talking about. But they basically are, are bars that keep fish from going into, getting entrained into, into turbines at dams from upstream. And you can see that they don't do very well when they get to a turbine or when they get to a trash bar. They just get tangled around them. They don't see them until they get to them. They just get all wound around them and try to go through them. And they get what's called impinged rather than entrained. That means they just get pinned against it and by the flow. So they end up dying anyway. Yeah. So. so most people, a lot of people, or some people, um, model entrainment as a function of flow and, and the ability of the fish to swim, but very few people actually model in, um, impingement, which for some species like this can be considerable. Uh, these are, have been considered for listing once, and they're still under review as um, threatened by, the, by ESA. 
Um, historically, this was a really important fish. It made up more than 40% of biomass in eastern coastal uh, rivers, and it was an important host for elliptio and other mussels. It's actually, you know, I have to look into whether that 40% figure is true because it is a top predator, and, and it's highly cannibalistic, and it's really interesting in that the, I'm just fascinated by eels. The females get much larger, and they tend to go farther upstream. And they thought at one time that they were kind of segregated by latitude. Starting out more broadly, they're one big panmictic population. And they all go out to the Sargasso Sea to spawn. And nobody's really documented that process. But there does not appear to be any genetic um, structure. And when they return, they follow the, the current. I'm trying to think what it's called. But anyway, that brings them along the coast of the North, North America, and they go into all of the rivers. And um, there's obviously no homing, since these are the juveniles that have been bred. They're called glass eels when they first are, um, when they emerge from being larvae, or when they metamorphose from being larvae, and then they're clear. And there's actually quite a large um, commercial glass eel fishery, and the mar main market is Japan, I think. And then they get into elvers, and they turn yellow, and they move upstream, and they're blocked by dams, or they're not. They're pretty good at climbing dams. So, so right now, like some NGOs are actually building eel ladders, because it's so easy to do. But the thing is that that's kind of creating an ecological trap, because they don't have much trouble getting up, but it's coming down where they're going to get whacked. You know, it's, they have very high mortality on the way down. So, um, let me talk about the modeling. Uh, this is this is done for the hydropower industry just to show how why they should pay me to to model eels because there's so much hydropower at risk. So, and some of the biggest plants are up here in the St. Lawrence Seaway. So the, I put together just a little quick model in R. And some of the simplifications that I made were that um, it's not actually a dynamic model. I just assume that each edge, it's a network model, each edge, which is a reach with either a dam above or not, or below or not, has eels. And I'm assuming that the size follows this relationship with inland river kilometer. So larger females are going to be farther inland. Then I overlap that um, size with the distribution of um, silver eels, which is also a function of river kilometer, to try to get how many of those are, are reprodu reproductive and are going to come downstream. And then they come down, and you can calculate like a shortest path using network libraries. And I calculate the survival as a function of entrainment and, um, and risk of entrainment and impingement. And those are functions of length that are dependent on the turbine type. So there's, I only have like one bogus turbine in there right now. But we're going to make that realistic and do it for the Roanoke and the Connecticut River basins. And then um, finally, the endpoint or my objective in the optimization is egg production. And from each of those upstream edges, I want to know how many eggs are they going to produce successfully by being able to um, go upstream, get large enough, become silver eels, and then come down successfully through the river system to back to the estuary. And then the hydropower side of things, so energy is my other objective. And that's just a function of flow and slope, as we discussed earlier. So I kind of see this, um, this decision diagram of looking, they're waiting to go upstream, eels mature. They may be trapped upstream or not. They look for a spillway. If they find a spillway, they can spill. You know what a spillway is? Probably not. OK, on dams, they have two routes to get downstream. You can either go through the turbines and take your risks, or you can, if there's too much flow, they open spillways, and you go over the top. And usually going over the top is safer. And there's sometimes they have like bypass structures, but that's really rare. At least it's 
well, I shouldn't say it's really rare. But anyway, if they find a bypass, if they avoid impingement, they're killed. If they find a spillway and avoid impingement, if they survive spill, then they go downstream. If they don't avoid impingement, do they find a bypass? Yes. And then, you know, maybe they get down, or maybe not, but it's a pretty complex decision tree and it's not very promising right now in terms of what those probabilities look like. So, so these are the results so far. And like I said, this is just a really small toy model. It's just generating a, f a random network in R of 12 nodes. I did not do anything with the terminal nodes, which are the ones on the outside, or the number one is the outlet. I haven't figured out how to make it plot as a tree. And um, it, obviously the one at the very top has the most deals with no dams. And as you would expect, the one at the bottom has um, all the dams that I allowed there to be. And um, there are a lot of other solutions along that front. But I did not really see support for the idea that you would not see solutions with, like I had some solutions on the front that had these two, which are one up from the estuary um, with dams. So they must have more advantage in terms of energy than I would have thought. And then another case study, you know, that's not very much on eels, but I've just begun to work on that. And Mike um, Kelly was involved in some of that. I've also been working with Chinook salmon for quite a while. And the problem there is um, in the Snake River, the um, rivers aren't the only things that are fragmented. This talk is pretty fragmented. Um, the problem there is that there's an ESA threatened stock of Chinook salmon, and the biop that um, NOAA Fisheries has come up with keeps talking about diversity criteria, which means that they want to have another population established. So that gets into uh, whether we should start transporting excess adults above Brownlee Dam to try to reestablish where the historic population was. And so in this other modeling study that I've done, I've looked at decision variables related to trapping and transport to see what kind of survival you'd need to actually have that second population. Well, I don't know if you'd really want to call it a population, whether it could really be a self-supporting separate genetic population, which I don't really think it could be. And secondly, how could it actually have demographic benefits? Uh, because basically you're having to take the returns all from one place. And the only way that you can identify where they came from is by marking, which is imperfect. And um, anyway, it shows that you'd have to have, you know, if you had a pretty high survival for the total survival from above Brownlee migrating downstream. Once you get to pretty high survival rates, then it becomes beneficial demographically. Um, but you have to trap at a pretty high rate, like 50%, which, which is feasible because that's, you know, they can trap a lot of, you can probably trap 80% of the fish that come upstream. So that's another example that has nothing really to do with river basin design, but it's another kind of connectivity question that's um, realistic and that comes up in the hydropower arena. So I just wanted to throw that in there as well. So just to come back to what we were talking about earlier, um, these are the propositions that we had come up with were to formulate the decision problems at the scale of large river basins to look at whether to concentrate dams within tributary subbasins and disperse the freshwater reserves among the remaining ones. And then also I think it's really important to try to make sure that there's habitat between dams, including tributary habitat, and to avoid creating ecological traps, which we sometimes can't really understand very well in terms of modeling unless we include some realism. So I'd like to give some acknowledgement to the other people that were involved in this review. The co-authors were Rebecca Ephraimson, Jeff Opperman and Mike Kelly. And I'd like to thank Jim Chandler and um, Phil, well, Phil um, Bates too and Ken LaPla at Idaho Power for their support for the Chinook salmon modeling. And then the DOE Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy Office at ORNL.
or who support ORNL. Are there any questions?